Um, it is really wonderful to host this event today. I want to thank you for being part of it. Um, we have a really nice group of people today, um, a fairly large group. I know there's more people who will still be coming on, but I was really pleased with the response to, the, uh, to this event. So uh, I'm looking forward to a lively group. Um, and we have people from all over uh, North America and, uh, and a couple people from Europe, I believe. So it really did uh, make its way around the globe. Um, so all of you who are interested in behind the scenes look at ekphrastic poetry, um, I think you're in for a treat today. Uh, okay. Um, I'm Christine Brooks Cody. I'm the founder of Shanti Arts. Uh, we got our start back in 2011. Uh, publishing a literary and art journal called Still Point Arts Quarterly. And this is the cover of one of our recent issues. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, and then we went on to begin publishing books, uh, covering a number of topics and genres. Uh, we published poetry, memoir, spirituality, uh, nature, travel. Um, among others. Um, it's been a terrific 11 year journey. I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, and I'm always grateful for the really wonderful artists and writers I get to work with. And four of those wonderful people are here today um, to share with us uh, their ekphrastic poetry. Uh, let's see if anybody needs to come in. Okay. All right. Um, let me quickly just say a couple things, and you probably already know this, but there also might be a couple newbies out there. So just a couple things about Zoom. First of all, make sure that you are muted. On the bottom left of your screen, there's a little button that says mute, and you want to click that until you see a red line go through it. And that means that we cannot hear you or hear any of the background sounds wherever you are. So if you would do that, and next to that, it says video. If you do not want to be seen, if you do not want your face displayed, just click that and your face will go away. And that's perfectly fine with us. However you're comfortable is okay with us. Um, uh, let's see. I suggest you keep the chat box open. If you click chat at the bottom of your screen, you will see a, um, a white bar open up on the right side of your screen. And this can allow for a little bit of inter interactivity. So if you want to um, you know, drop a comment down at the bottom, it says type message here. And as we're going along, if you want to type something like, oh, I agree, <laughs> um, or what a great point, um, you can certainly do that. Can you see where I just typed something there on the right? OK. And at the bottom where it says type message here, right above that, it should say everyone. So that means that whatever you want to send, everyone will see it. And if you think of questions while the event is going on, go ahead and pose your questions. And that will remind us to try to get back to those questions um, when we get to the end of the discussion portion. OK. Um, I should point out this event is being recorded so that we can put it on YouTube and post it on our website afterwards for those people who couldn't come. Okay. All right. Also, just to provide you with a very rough agenda, so you know where we're going, um, let me say this. Um, I will say a few introductory remarks, and then um, you will hear from each of the poets in turn, uh, and they will talk about their book and read from their work. Um, and then after that, we'll have a little bit of a, a pause I'm going to say just a few things in general about Shanti Arts and some things about our journal that I just showed you. Um, and also something about our next Zoom, which will be in November and will be very interesting as well. And then we'll go back and we'll hear again from the poets and also from Karen Elias, who is with us today, who's a photographer and worked with Marjorie on their book together. So um, uh, we'll have another chance to go back and hear from them. Um, and that's when you'll get the behind the scenes look. I'm sorry about this. Okay, uh, that should take that. <laughs> um, all right. Sorry about that interruption there. Okay. All right, so let's get going here. 
Um, our focus today is ekphrastic poetry. And in its beginnings in ancient Greece, the term ekphrasis was applied to the skill of being able to describe something in vivid detail. So the original intention was to describe a work of art, let's say. These days, perhaps a piece that one might see in a museum, something perhaps by one of the masters, or it could be a piece by a contemporary artist seen in a gallery when you're out walking around town, or it could be a piece of art created by a friend or a relative who's an, an artist. But as the form has developed, there is much more to ekphrastic poetry than just saying it is poetry about art or poetry that describes art objects. If you think about all the ways we engage in and respond to art, we quickly realize that ekphrastic poetry can be both wide and deep. It covers a lot of territory. Think for a moment about one of your favorite paintings and think about how you respond to it. I think of Rothko, I love Rothko. <laughs> um, your response might be to notice and enjoy the physical features of the piece, um, the colors, the shapes, the lines. Your response might be emotional, how the piece makes you feel, whether it's happy, sad, angry, confused. Um, you might try to figure out the message of the piece and related to that, you might try to figure out how to interpret it or what's happening in the piece. And you might wonder what the artist is trying to tell you. You might find that an art object brings to mind something about your life. Perhaps it reminds you of a place you once visited and you stand looking at it and you think back to the times when you were there. Or perhaps it, it brings to mind a place you wish you could visit and all of your hopes and dreams about that place um, come forward. Any and all of these are possible responses to art and can be part of ekphrastic poetry. So my conclusion is that ekphrastic poetry is not only about art, it's about us. It's about the viewer, it's about life, it's about experience. And that's what makes ekphrastic poetry so exciting. It's using an art object as the instrument of awareness and writing about that. So today we have three poets who have written ekphrastic poetry. First, Joseph Stanton, an art historian and poet who recently retired from his position at the University of Hawaii. Uh, he was professor of art history and American studies. Next, we have Lee Woodman, who spent her career as a public radio producer at the Library of Congress and worked in multimedia at the Smithsonian. Then we have Marjorie Maddox, who's a professor of English and creative writing who's published over a dozen books of poetry as well as several children's books. How these three individuals approach ekphrastic poetry varies. And that's what's so exciting about today's presentation. And you will also meet Karen Elias, a photographer who worked with Marjorie on their book, Heart Speaks is Spoken For. And you'll hear the interesting story about that, their collaboration to do that book. So that's where we're headed. That's what I have to say. Now we're going to turn to the poets. And first off, Joseph Stanton. Um, we have actually published two of Joe's books. Uh, the most recent one is um, Prevailing Winds. And this painting on the front is uh, Hurricane in the Bahamas by Winslow Homer. And a couple of years ago, we published Moving Pictures. Another Winslow Homer on the cover, uh, one that a lot of people like this piece, um, Snap the Whip. Uh, this is an excerpt of it. The painting is actually much bigger, um, but I, I love it as well. I love the red building. Um, I love the clothing. I love that boys are running around outside. <laughs> uh, I really love that piece. So uh, you can kind of see what, um, what Joe is interested in, American studies, American art. Um, he's now retired from the University of Hawaii, but he continues to teach in various places, um, including the Honolulu Museum of Art. Um, he comes to New York City every year to do a bunch of things there, and he's been to Cooperstown. And if you know what Cooperstown is famous for, you'll know that he has published uh, books about baseball, um, poetry about baseball, and he's used paintings or art objects that illustrate baseball. 
So I'm going to pass it over to Joe. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my we, approach we need to your sound, Joe. Oh, isn't it on? I thought I. Uh... Yeah, it's on. Nope, we still can't hear you. I can. Put yes, that button. I could hear him. He's, he's on. No, the uh, red line is not on there. I You're hear. Good. I can hear you. I can hear you. So I can hear you too. Anybody else hear him? Yes. Well, Christine, yeah. you must have muted me. I can, I can hear him as well. Maybe okay. Christine. Okay, I think we've got it. All right, go ahead, Joe. Okay, well, my art-inspired poems are of many sorts, so it's pretty hard to define the whole uh, breadth and uh, width of it. But but sometimes my poems describe the artworks. Sometimes a story implicit in the artwork is presented. Sometimes there is a monologue by one of the characters, the artist, or the artwork itself. I often think of my poems as variations on aspects of the inspiring artwork. <clears throat> uh, in addition to writing response to paintings and sculptures, I've written response to plays, fairy tales, musical works, uh, and movies. <clears throat> uh, my poetry reading today will provide you with an array of examples of the sorts of art-inspired poems I have included in my collections. First, I'll look at Moving Pictures, which is one of my uh, collections with Shanti Arts Press. And I'm not going to talk about the artworks particularly because I feel like the, well, hopefully the poems stand on their own. Of course, nowadays people can pretty much Google and find their way to the particular artwork they want to look at it. So I won't do a lot of explaining. Renee Magritte's The Unexpected Answer. The way out or the way in might be a jagged hole that breaks through where you need to go. Despite the door you might simply have opened. Your advance cracks a passage unexpected into a darkness grim and oddly inviting. The floorboards carry you forward as if yours were an ordinary life, while the absence of light in the place that awaits would seem to be horrific and comic all at once. Like the life and death exits of Bugs Bunny and Roadrunner that rely on impossibilities through which no nemesis could pass. So next I'm gonna read my poem inspired by Snap the Whip, the, uh, you know, the one that's on the cover of this. One of the great things about this particular book is the beautiful design job that Christine did on the book, uh, often including uh, reproductions of works that were, you can't really see this, but in works that are in the public domain, she was able to put some of those on facing pages, which is absolutely fabulous. So here is Winslow Homer's Snap the Whip. Snap the Whip is a game of run and fall, of wanting to hang on, but falling after all. The running takes the boys towards a goal that must be nothing in particular, an open meadow, an expanse of flowers, a distant mountain, a waiting schoolhouse. The point of the game is holding on, deftly, desperately, but there would seem to be, at last, no way to win, no way to lose. The Yank back team is composed of all who have fallen so far. Therefore, this game, if not for weariness or the end of recess, could go on refining its fall and rise until the end of time. <laughs> so uh, Edward Hopper's room in New York is uh, another uh, focus here. And uh, I've written quite a bit about Edward Hopper, both as a, an art historian and as a poet. The same is true of, of Winslow Homer. Those are kind of my two guys in some respects. Edward Hopper's room in New York. Seated in the room's one comfortable chair, a husband hunches forward, intent upon his paper as if his life depended on the scores he finds there. Just home from work, he has not yet loosened his tie, nor spoken with his wife, who is wearing her bright red dress, the one with the bow in back that comes easily undone. She knows that he has not noticed, so she plunks the keys of her piano to say to him softly that she is there and has been waiting all day for him. The room glows, yellow walls, 
oak table and door, the rosy tones of the man's chair and the woman's dress. Something could come of this. Now, I've done a lot, as I said, with, with Edward Hopper. Uh, I was, when, one time when I was, after I had written this poem and, you know, I decided, well, I'm going to do some back, uh, back research on things. And so I look at the Wikipedia article. And one of the things I found there was that the Wikipedia article, article was quoting an art historian named Joseph Stanton about how uh, this particular painting was one of those instances of alienation between, you know, uh, the two characters or, you know, the husband and wife which actually, if you think about what my poem contained, I actually took a totally different stance in writing the poem. I kind of went against the conventional sort of loneliness obsession view of Edward Hopper. So I thought, who is this Joseph Stanton art historian who's telling me what I should think about this particular picture? Uh, by the way, I once gave a paper at a conference in which I talked about Edward Hopper as viewed by myself as an art historian and Joseph Hopper and Edward Hopper as, you know, in my poems. And I found that those two people did not agree with one another uh, quite often in their perspective. So there's a little bit on that. And then, um, so I'll, I'll go to uh, the next one here, which is um, uh, my first book of ekphrastic poetry was Imaginary Museum Poems on Art. And I'm gonna read a poem inspired by Henri Rousseau's Sleeping Gypsy. Henri has wrapped his gypsy in a dream of many colors, stripes of pleated gauze gleaming. Above and beyond, he makes the silence a place, dark blue but punctured by light. A white-faced mask floats, smiling over a beige and ochre undulation of desert. At the center of this silence, where sky and sand devise a horizon, a brown brooding of violence appears. A shadow carnivore breathing the edge of sleep, a ceramic emblem of devouring who will soundlessly pass on, leaving the toy doll gypsy, her tightly tuned tan mandolin, an orange jar of night cooled air to whatever music the stars can unwittingly prepare. All the echoing sounds there have to do with my feeling that the kind of um, there's something magical about the work and about the nighttime scene. And I felt like the, as you know, happens in Shakespeare, the use of rhymes in a very intense way sometimes gives that you know, feeling of a sense of trying to imply magic or something uh, sort of uh, mystical. Uh, now I'm gonna read a poem that is an interesting exception in that you know, usually you think the ekphrastic poem is gonna be free verse because you're gonna to try to control what you wanna say about the artwork. This one, I happen to write a sonnet. Uh, and I, that just is an example of how, why can't you end up using a traditional form, uh, you know, a, as a way of actually helping you uh, find the right word. Sometimes the traditional form forces you to think more about what might be the right word. In any case, Georges Seurat's Evening at Enfleur. Seurat's science calls horizontals calm but down the slope of pilings, they turn sad while sunset breaks white against the solemn black of jagged rock. His light's a stern, mad landscape divided into tiny balls. This picture's machine calculates why one pale dot hewed against the next recalls a cool gaiety, not unlike the sky spread out above a certain slant of shore. Somehow we understand this riddled air and suspended in thought above on floor because Seurat saw something like it there. His art's division dots define a scheme conceived as theory that we must see as dream. So there's a lot of things that ekphrastic poetry can do. I was uh, very inspired by people that came before me, uh, you know, W.D. Steingrass actually is one of them, but I decided that Matisse would not like what Snodgrass had to say about the Red Studio. His, there was recently a fabulous exhibit in New York at the, at the MoMA that I was able to see about this particular painting. In any case, Snodgrass decided that the reason the Red Studio was so vividly 
so tremendously red was because it was, you know, a ferocious red thing and it had swallowed the artist. So the idea of the artist being devoured by his painting was the kind of main point of this poem. I decided, well, I don't think uh, Matisse, who thought about his art as a, you know, a glass of wine to be had in the dinner, would, I didn't think Matisse would agree with Snodgrass about this view of this work. So I had Matisse respond to Snodgrass in this poem. I'm gonna read the epigraph, you know, which is a few lines from the Snodgrass poem as I read it. And um, so I'm not gonna read it with a French accent because I sound like a bad uh, Maurice Chevalier if I tried to do that. So I'll just read it in my own voice. Matisse replies to Snodgrass, a poem about a poem about a painting. His mind turned in in concentrated fury till he sank his own room drank him. W.D. Snodgrass, Matisse, the Red Studio. Looking into my Red Studio, were you surprised to find no one there? Calm yourself, my friend. I was only out of sight, preparing the space for visitors. Since I am not a part of what I see, I leave myself unframed. Do you understand? The room is decorated for pleasure, colored warm to comfort your needled heart. My art is an embrace, not a devour. Come inside, a painted chair awaits you. I will be there. Together we will share a refreshing drink of my bright scarlet air. <laughs> so the way in which, uh, you know, so ekphrasis can be many things, can go in many directions in terms of what it, what it does. And so, uh, and in fact, um, there is a uh, uh, interesting way in which uh, you can get a uh, more than one thing being responded to. Uh, Laura Rubia, a great artist uh, in Hawaii, is is in the room here, and I wanted to read a poem that I wrote inspired by a sequence of uh, serigraph prints that she made re relating to Diamond Head, one of our great uh, tourist attractions and things in Hawaii. And uh, not only am I responding to you know, various uh, images from Laura's series of, of prints, but I'm also uh, kind of parodying in a way, uh, a very famous poem by Wallace Stevens. So here is 13 ways of looking at a diamond head. Among 20 tourist brochures, the only thing truly moving was the ridge itself, stark above the park. I was of a hundred steps, like a bunker rising steeply. The dormant volcano whirled clouds at dawn, grain of curly koa drifting. A man and a woman in a picture are one. A man and a woman in a picture postcard of Diamond Head are one multiplied by everyone else. I do not know which to prefer, the crater as a conch shell, as a fish head fin, as a geometric abstraction, as an Easter Island figure facing up, as what rises when I round a corner. We kick balls across wide fields in slanting light, diamond held, diamond head intricately played with its colors. So I'm not gonna, I just, I'm getting kind of long here, but I'm, I ended it with uh, traffic is moving, diamond head, I'm sorry, traffic is moving diamond head. It must be morning. Okay. It's something about Hawaii traffic. It was Kona weather all afternoon. The sky whispered warm rumors of ash. Diamond head gazed through haze at Waikiki's swarming sprawl, dreaming lava. So I'm wanting to give diamond head some agency there about resisting uh, everything that was around it. So there's, it had 13 parts. So I, I did want to uh, cut that short. Uh, Prevailing Winds is uh, my new book just come out this year. And uh, I wanted to read uh, about a work that's in the Holland Museum of Art. Francis Bacon's Three Studies for a Self-Portrait. A mirror he feared could be full of tricks. So why not save face by tripling it? Bacon knew existence questionable. So he never stopped questioning what he himself might be. He loved to see in threes with his triptychs speaking to a holiness of altered pieces. 
suggestive swerves fleshed against absolute dark, constituting a reliquary, an elusive self, his own, for instance, bespeaking a broken remnant of martyrdom. Obviously, I'm playing off the whole idea of an altarpiece, which is what a triptych often is. But of course, uh, Francis Bacon had his own sense of what a, a triple, a triptych could be. Now, I engaged in several collaborations over the course of many years with Adam LeBlanc, a visual artist. We recently did an exhibition called Nights on B Street. If you're interested, you could Google that and actually see a video about our collaboration on that. It, because of the pandemic, it never opened to the general public which was kind of a sad, uh, to say the least, moment for both of us. But I'd like to read one of the poems that I wrote uh, out of the uh, several, I think, uh, 15 that I wrote, inspired by the, the aspects of Nights on B Street. And so this is, there, uh, Marjorie's going to be talking about collaboration, but in a sense, a piece like this has to do with not just what I see visually in the work, but my conversations with the artist, with Adam LeBlanc, and my own experience of living in New York City. And so there all those elements, I think, converge in the poem. So it's not simply about the work of art, but it's about, you know, as no actresting poem is simply about the work of art, but, but it, it brings together a lot of these different aspects. So I'm just going to read one of these. Blue Note. He plays for her over and over, never let me go. He feels the five notes his pale sack sings, never let me go, a note for each sad syllable. She is, he knows, the tune he plays, blue on blue, notes that weep their song because she is oh so very gone. Only in his mind does she sit on the stoop beside the closed red door. The lateness of the night too is a note he plays but absence is the why his sack sings. His world still yet so full of her shadow. Never let me go, he pleads, his breath floating the tune to the sky, his sax whispering to the moon's not so neon glow. Never let me go. By the way, I once uh, was walking through New York City late at night and heard somebody playing a saxophone down some side street. I had no idea what was going on with that because it wasn't crowded enough for the person to be busking or anything, but it just was just somebody playing. And that's part of uh, what's going on with that. How am I doing on the time, Christine? Yeah, we're getting close. Just maybe another half a minute or so. Okay, so I just want to, just I'm going to read a short poem. Uh, that is uh, inspired by Edward Hopper's Nighthawks. Now I've written three poems, two of them very long, inspired by Nighthawks, but just to show you how various one might respond to a work of art. And I apologize to anybody on this, on this Zoom that is a Yankee fan, because this is having to do with the uh, 1942 World Series, which of course was won by the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, they won four games, the Yankees won one, so it was decided in five games, that's important to this poem. And of course, I'm imagining the, this couple, you know, as uh, talking about this. Edward Hopper's Nighthawks consider the 1942 World Series. I'm rooting for the Cardinals anyway, she mutters, staring at her pack of matches. No way the Yanks can lose, he declares, to his wife, the counterman, and the world in general. They cream that Mort Cooper, and he's the only real pitcher they've got this guy Beasley they're putting on the mound tomorrow, a punk kid. I'll bet the Yankees chew him up and spit him out in the first. No way this thing is going more than five. And of course, it didn't go more than five because the Cardinals won in, in five games. So maybe I should include on that uh, uh, sort of note, having rounded all the bases there. Should, should I stop there, Christine? Is that good? Oh, you got to unmute yourself. There I go. Um, yes, let's move on to Lee. Thanks very much, Joe. And we will get back to you shortly. Um, well, yes. <laughs> um, we'll move on to Lee. Um, in January of this year, we released Lee's book, Artscapes. It has a striking cover. 
Um, and she uh, it was preceded by three other poetry collections titled Mindscapes, Homescapes, and Lifescapes. And I'm anxious to know what the next one will be. So if you can drop a hint. <laughs> um, before becoming a poet, Lee worked in media for various art and culture organizations, including the Smithsonian. Um, then as executive producer of her own company, she worked for the Library of Congress, uh, the World Bank, and NPR. In 2020, she won the William Meredith Prize for Poetry, and she received a poetry fellowship from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities in both 2019 and 2020. She holds a bachelor's degree in art from Colby College, just 45 minutes up the highway here, and a master's degree in art education from Hartford Art School. And we're thrilled that she's here to tell us and talk to us about her book. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, and let me just go full here. Um, so I first, wanted to talk about the fact that people always wonder, how do you choose an art piece? And so I thought I would say how and where I look at art. And galleries and major museums and private collections are the more obvious ones, but also street fairs, craft shows, parades, parks, opera houses, nightclubs, and I think the most important thing I can share about looking at all of these things or listening to music or watching dance is that observation is everything, you know, looking at details. And when I teach poetry, I suggest to students who might think that art is unusual or poetry is unusual, just forget about it. Just what do you notice? What do you wonder? And then what stays with you after you notice something? So it could be that you notice something big or little or horizontal or vertical or a certain color or shape. Uh, characters and characters can be people, but they also could be insects or imaginary animals or monsters. And then as Christine said, there's usually a tone in an artwork and it could be mysterious or alluring or scary or whimsical, goofy. And um, the last thing I would say is when I go to a street fair or to an art gallery or to um, a, someone's private collection, something usually draws me over and says, hey, come, come look at me. And so that's what, I do. I, I feel like the artwork chooses me. And the first poem I'm going to read um, is about a work by Andy Warhol. And let me just put this on full screen. Are you seeing it full screen? Yes, yes, we are. Okay, great, great. So, okay, so Andy Warhol's artwork is of Mao. And you'll see in this first shot, his square jaw, his direct gaze, here his hand on his chest and the purple and lavender wash um, and then what I noticed as I stared and stared, look, there's a yellow figure kind of coming up behind his head. And I thought, aha, there's another character in here. Here's the poem, Vancouver, after Andy Warhol's Mao, 1973. Mao chooses me, massive man, square head, Solid stance, leader, CCP, deep purple background, violet wash. I must stop. Struck still in the gallery, I conjure his maker, Andy Warhol, because he's there too. Golden plumage, 
Same two tufts, both heads the shape of Hello Kitty, lurking from behind, Warhol slips into the chairman's left sleeve. Bodies morph, merge as portrait, breathe in unison. By reflex, my hand clasps my chest, autonomic gasp. I realize they're wearing my blouse. Single button. Three is one, we pledge allegiance. Hands crossing hearts, their countenance exactly mine. Stony stare, contemplating. Six nostrils blend into two. Our lipstick is lavender, our chin set. Who is who? I am Chairman Mao. <laughs> the next one is a wonderful, wonderful painting by Eugène Delacroix from um, 1834. And this is the wide shot. I'm gonna show some details because I'm always staring at details. This shows two of the women. If you notice their bare feet and their blouses kind of unhooked, showing their uh, chests. And there's a red door behind and they're kind of leaning on cushions. And then another look and you see a hookah in the foreground suggesting that they're smoking. And then in the white shot again, on the right hand side is this black Algerian woman. And um, in the back, you'll see a mirror kind of tilting down. And this gave me the inspiration to write this poem called, in which I consider myself a possible woman of Algiers. Delacroix, like me, is charmed but deluded, fascinated by their harem allure, luscious flesh, bejeweled bodices, vibrant costumes, figs. Entering through swinging saloon doors, I pose for them. My magenta bloomers are brighter than theirs. My cheeks burn violet energy. They do not look my way. I am disturbing the languor, familiar stupor. Leaning on thick rugs, bolstered pillows, these plump doyens are adorned with gold necklaces coyly covered by see-through muslin blouses. Turkish turned up sandals thrown to the side, meaty feet, stubby toes. At times, our lady <laughs> To ease a hip or elbow, discomfort does not suit them. Bored with the hookah, they compare the men they bedded last night. A corpulent prince with lacquered hair, sanctimonious merchant smelling of musk, odoriferous suitor, stale wine, spunk. Spiritless, they wait uncounted hours Tomorrow night will be a repeat. I went through this book talk that I forgot. Blue, black Algerian servant Samia turns away from them. She's heard it all before. The mirror on the tiled wall above them tilts forward. She has not bothered to straighten it. She stops abruptly when she sees me. Am I a new consort? She determines not. We are kindred spirits, she and I, different kind of gems. We recognize this luxuriant space as dark. 
Light shines through a depressed window, but to no end. It doesn't go anywhere, only opens to the kitchen where Samia is headed. I believe it leads to Exodus. We could run fast, holding hands to escape this confinement. As I attempt to find my way across the circle of ladies, a putrid smell arises. Moths in the drapes, cockroaches in the corner, truth exhaling from the rotten flesh of women under those bloomers. Dressed up dolls dulled by men who tell them they are well taken care of, don't realize their pearl anklets, endless hashish, servants in waiting keep them captive for life. I pick my way through the airless world, across plush carpets to follow brave Samia. At least Delacroix had foresight to render her fleet feet with shoes on. And the last set I'm going to read kind of an interesting combination of art, music, and dance. The first part of it is written, actually painted by Matisse, a sketch for a commission he was asked to make called Dance. And then huh, a very similar graphic art, by Gabrielle Wijaja in 2020. And she is of East, uh, Indonesian and Chinese um, heritage and clearly knows the Western art and Eastern traditions that she wants to amplify. So I'll start with Matisse and then go to Wijaja. This poem is called Conundrum, after Henri Matisse's dance, 1909. Light comes behind, illuminating a mural in motion. Five audacious nudes, straight black hair, float weightlessly into emerald green, cerulean blue. Attached and unattached, bound in rhythms of relentless circles, unclear as to who leads and who follows. It doesn't matter. One pushes, one reaches, another glances down. A painter no longer needs to be preoccupied by details. Fling the color, hue the gesture, read the orchestra. Toss tradition, liberate the farandole. It's just a sketch. Murmurs of Modigliani, shades of Stravinsky sneak in. The music hastens, violins beat like frantic footsteps. Flutes blow elongated bodies into sinuous whirling. Like recurring dreams, Strangers and places meld into a sort of sixth sense. Earth or cloud, ocean or sky, family or stranger, who cares? But worries infiltrate these unknown maidens cast in a spell. It does matter. We must give ear. Bacchanalia, ode to joy, mock abduction, or trance. These figures keep orbiting, convinced they can save each other, wrapped in dance. And then let's see what Gabrielle Wijaja does that, having just graduated from art school two years ago. 
This is all about how artists stand on each other's shoulders, whether they're musicians or painters or ceramicists or neon artists. They're really looking and then building. So this last poem is called, Something Seems Familiar. Henri Matisse's figures dance au naturel. We Jaja takes the cannon west to east. Demoiselle in colorful graphic gracefully compete the circle. Clasping hands, they pass tall groundswells. Dressed in red jipao, they perform a dance nouvelle and slyly reclaim heritage, profound and bittersweet. Henri Matisse's figures dance au naturel. Ouijaja takes the cannon west to east. With humor, she calls her artworks gentle oriental, eager to taste infuse her kindred background, Chinese. Sans apology, she appropriates with glee. Her group of femme fatale dance parallel, standing on shoulders of those who danced au naturel. We've seen this before. Five women clutching hands dance near the shore. Volcanoes erupt in the ocean nearby with waves swirling around, propelled by the force. But wait, the dancers are wearing traditional dress, their hair up in buns. Is this a painting? Or a print that is numbered with a stamp of Chinese? I search for a form and realize that once all art is wild capture, all life is pre-learned. What we have read has been written before. What we hear now are recomposed scores. And yet, all reimagined, so fresh and new, astonishing remnants spurt masterful bloom. So that's a partial rondelle and then followed by free verse, which I think is a very common thing. And I like to do in poetry is use traditional forms and then free verse. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lee, very much. Um... All right, we're going to move on now to, oh, there you go. I was going to suggest you stop your screen. Okay, we're going to move on to Marjorie and Karen. Uh, Marjorie Maddox is professor of English at Lock Haven University in Pennsylvania. Uh, mm -hmm. She has published 13 collections of poetry, including the uh, one that we just published not too long ago, Heart, and you can't, can you see me? Um, Heart Speaks is Spoken For. Uh, which was a collaboration with photographer Karen Elias, who was joining us as well. Um, I wanted to point out that we are also publishing um, Marjorie's next collection, which is also a crastic poetry, um, and it's titled In the Museum of My Daughter's Mind, which is an absolutely wonderful title. Um, and it will feature artwork by several artists, including, as the title indicates, her daughter, Anna Lee Hafer. Uh, so we look forward to that coming out. Uh, Marjorie has also published story collections, children's books, and books for young adults, and has an interest in baseball like Joe does, um, having written Rules of the Game, baseball poems. And Karen Elias uh, taught college English for 40 years. She's an artist activist using photography to raise awareness about climate change. And in addition to Heart Speaks is spoken for, she has collaborated with Marjorie on various other projects. Um, and Karen is also a playwright and has had work chosen by the Climate Change Theater Action Group, which was then performed in eight different countries. So welcome Marjorie and Karen. Thank you, I'll go first. Um, I wanted to just show you, can you see this? This is our object 
of common focus <laughs> for the book that we wrote together. And I'll just do a very quick slideshow to give you a sense of our, of our collaboration. So this is the stone that I discovered on the beach in Maine back in 2018. And I saw it as an emblem of all that I'm feeling about the climate and about the state of our world. I took pictures against different backgrounds and called them morning songs for the earth. So one of the poems that I think Margie will read is the poem about called Treacherous Driving. And to um, illustrate this, I decided that I would invert the heart image to make it look more fragile and ice-like. So I put it together with a photo that I had taken of snow swirls plus a map of Ohio where the uh, where the Margie's poem takes place. And this is what we came up with. This is called Snow Heart. So sometimes in our collaboration, the poem inspired the image as here in a poem uh, <laughs> that uses actually my hand and a heart in the middle of it with sort of <laughs> gothic streams coming down. <laughs> and sometimes it was the other way around. The stone allowed me to make visible places where the heart goes in silence or in secret. The chopping block, quarantine, or bearing witness to our fragile planet. <clears throat> when George Floyd was murdered in May of 2020, I tucked blossoms from our bridal bush into the crevices of our wrought iron patio table with the broken heart at the center and made a makeshift memorial. <clears throat> I thought the wrought iron background created a cage-like structure that hinted at the realities of racism faced by Blacks and people of color in America. But Margie saw depths beneath the iron grating and imagined a bridge to a future fertile with promise. So one of the benefits of collaboration is to spark new seeing and new thinking, which is what has happened. It's been a wonderful collaboration and it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Yes, I can just echo that. It has been um, a marvelous journey that we've been on together and I'm gonna just share the screen too. Um, we ended up, I think, both creating things that we would have never created otherwise if we hadn't been inspired by each other's work. And as Karen said, sometimes um, the poem came first, sometimes the photograph came first. So there was a real sense of going back and forth um, with this. And um, sometimes uh, Karen would just shoot me an email and send me a photograph. Um, and, you know, I'd have a stack of papers and I know oh, I'm going to get to that later. And, and I'd be so tempted that I'd put things aside and I'd start fiddling around and then kind of come back to it a little bit later. Um, and, and sometimes it would go the other way around as well. I would send her something and, and ask her if she wanted to, to play around with that. So this, as Karen mentioned, um, this image of, uh, treacherous driving, um, Actually, this is our first collaboration and we were linked together. We were paired together at an art museum um, uh, collaboration exercise. And so Karen was given my poem and I was given a different photograph of Karen's um, that didn't have a heart in it. So that's why it's not in this collection. Um, and we both, uh, we, we actually cheated. We asked for each other's work because we had already known of each other's um, 
um, artwork. And so we um, we were really already kind of leaning towards each other in that way. But I love what, what Karen created from this poem. And so a little bit of background about the poem um, that some of you know. My, my father had his first heart attack when he was 38. He lived until the age of 65. He has had 10 cardiac arrests. Um, and during the, the blizzard or right before the blizzard of 93, and those of you who live on the East Coast may remember this, um, I had been out, I lived in Pennsylvania. I had been out to Ohio to visit my parents and heard news of the blizzard coming. I rushed back to my fairly new teaching job in Pennsylvania. Uh, a man died in a car accident. My father got his heart, but I couldn't get back because all the roads were completely shut down. So it was a number, I think it was almost a week before I could get back. My fa father's blood eventually became infected and, and he didn't survive. Uh, but I kept thinking about this stranger's heart being buried inside of my father. So this is the poem, Treacherous Driving. It's as safe as traveling to work, a cardiologist before performing a transplant. The first night of the blizzard, that stranger inched into Ohio. Halfway through, he skidded into our snow speckled lives. His heart is buried in my father, who is buried. This is the hole in the stranger, in my father, in my own cracked chest, hail cupped in its cavity, the aorta beginning to freeze. All winter, the weather preaches white lies, fields blank of roads, a curve straightened, the even light of sky. Tonight, the breeze is all icicle, banner-like from the clouds. Nothing is movable in this treacherous state. Our wheels spin, their rhythm a breath that pulls us, then stalls. The law of the body of the state cannot replace the chain reaction, jackknifed lives, hope piling into hope. The man and his heart, cold on an icy road, warmed us for weeks while winter, a clear blue thing, wafted light. And I think you can see how well uh, Karen's composite photographs captures those images that I've already put into the poem. Um, and then just, you know, I think elevates the, the poem or deepens it maybe to just a whole nother level when these are two things are combined. Okay, I'm just gonna flip through and show you some other images. Um, I, I love the creation of this with the computer cord. Um, and this is the one um, that we chose as the kind of title poem. Karen had called it Heart Speaks is Spoken For. And I think you can tell how that kind of captures um, what the poem and the artwork are doing. You know, they're kind of speaking to each other. Um, they're speaking for other people when we get to um, things like the, the poem about George Floyd, which I'll talk about um, later on. Um, but this, and I, you know, and I actually can't remember which of these came first, or I think we may have created them separately and then decided that they worked well together. Is, is that your memory, Karen? Um, because I, I really thought this this image of the heart with the gold underneath, and it seemed like it was kind of emerging, um, and it was uh, kind of bursting forth after being maybe buried. Um, so the poem is is was inspired also about this idea of um, when a, a person gets a donor heart or any kind of donor organ, they often take on the characteristics of the person who donated the organ. So similar tastes in food or music um, or personalities. At least this is kind of the anecdotal evidence, transplanted. Though they'd never met, the man with the dead man's heart inside him dreamed his donor's face, limbs, lungs, sung in his sleep the dead man's favorite song in the deep baritone voice that wasn't his own, but his, the one not known or seen or heard except in night's deep cradle of sleep, this stranger's metronome of a heart humming behind ribs that no longer felt like his, 
beautiful fence for an organ lifted from someone else's afterlife. Even waking the new old man and his heart now know nothing of old boundaries, the ones composed by the living. Instead, in bright, silent daylight, he takes his first tentative beat toward love. Mm. And I'll, I'll come back to some of these other ones later. But just to give you a sense of, of her, just uh, her, her powerful images and why they would inspire, you know, a poetic response. Um, so here um, we were most of the book before the pandemic, but then we really felt like, um, you know, we should add some poems about the pandemic since we were going through that as we were, were editing. And I love that we have these two um, hearts in separate windows. Um, and most of us have experienced this, I think, where you mm -hmm. felt both bonded maybe more to people, but also isolated at the same time. You know, there was that kind of combination of those two contradictory things. Quarantine. Apart inside, together they stare not at each other, but at the worn world beyond arm's reach. There, the child alone, hopscotching away her worries. And there, the single blue jay dotting the drab day with color. What is no more and what is still keeps moving through the familiar view. Remember, one laughs or sighs, turning again toward the other together inside. And as um, both Joe and Lee said, you know, one of the things that you're looking at with ekphrastic poetry is to find that perspective, find that point of view. And there's so many opportunities in, in a piece of artwork, you know, where are you going to come from? Are you looking out? Are you looking in? Are you doing both? Um, what else are you noticing that's going on? How can you become part of, of, of the image? And here was another one that was based on the quarantine. And uh, then I wanted to show you this one since Karen um, really started her work with this stone, with the, this, the series of Morning Song for the Earth. And what struck me about this particular uh, photograph, and the photograph came first in this case, um, was how it something so beautiful can really, uh, really be a symbol of destruction and um, deterioration and um, everything that's going wrong with, with the earth. And um, so morning song for the earth. Here the stone heart waits for the tug of tide, the undertow of pole, the grainy tabula rasa of mind lapped clean of conscience or not. Even now, seaweeds entwine, brittle entanglements rot in the sun. The dying snare the dead, such rocky shores. Each dawn, the gauls, the gauls call their crescendo of shriek, capsized days breaking into dirge. The cracked and soulful, as lonely as this sad ballad of loss, swooping low, then rising in mornings, daily obeyed of hope. Such deceptive beauty, elegy for the earth. And then I'm just going to end this section with a, a, a short one that's a, more hopeful. And this is a, a poem that to me is be kind of kind of come become emblematic um, of what we've all been through. And hopefully there's some hope um, at the end too. Heart like in stone. This is what they know: the dip into frigid, the shadowed shelter of cave the beauty of decay at dusk, at dawn, the tattooed rays of one more orbit of earth around a sun that says, hold on, hold on, hold on. And they want to, and they do, and they will, lingering a little longer beneath the open branches of forest, beside the cool stream of hope, waiting for you, for me, for whoever stumbles first down the long path, calling their names and this sense of kind of the togetherness and helping each other and um, just persistence and, um, um, you know, holding on, I guess, again, 
really spoke to me by seeing the image of uh, of the lichen and the hearts and the the stone all there together with the shadows. Okay, I'll pause here and and pass it back uh, to Christine, and then uh, we'll talk again a little bit later. Okay, hey, great. Thank you, Marjorie and Karen. Uh, as she said, we're going to take just a little bit of a break. I want to talk about a couple of other things related to Shanti Arts. But I want you to notice all of the comments in the chat room. If you don't have it displayed, um, click chat on the bottom of your screen. And there are all kinds of people are saying all kinds of interesting and wonderful things. Um, so it's fun just to kind of glance through that. Um, a few minutes ago, I sent to everyone um, a, a PDF file, which is called Handout Acrastic. You don't have to look at that now because I'm going to show it to you. Um, but at some point, if you want to have that or, or send it to friends or whatever, um, you can take a peek at that. I'll show you what's in it. Uh, let's see, share. Um, okay. All right, there's just a little bit of a description here of Shanti Arts, and here's a link which you can click when you open the document that'll show you all of the things we do. And there are lots of things we're doing. First of all, the books that we've been publishing, these are some of our recent titles. Um, you can get a sense of, um, you know, kind of the topics and genres that we're working with. And a link here if you want to explore all the titles that we've published recently. And this is a little bit about our quarterly. I mentioned it early on. Um, this is the cover of our current issue, Fall 22 the theme of which is immersed in books. And you may download it. If you click this link, you can download the entire current issue, uh, 120 pages of reading that I think you'll find very enjoyable. And you can also download past issues. Um, so that's enough reading to keep you busy for a long, long time. Um, you can also sign up using this link to receive the digital edition in your mailbox every three months. You can subscribe to the print edition if you wish. And if you are a writer or artist, and I know many of you are, you can submit uh, write, writing or art for future issues. So you may want to take a look through some of that. Uh, this was the uh, poster for today's event. And I have a page here for each of the books that we've been talking about. Um, this is Marjorie and Karen's book. Here's a link if you wish to purchase the book. And please note that it is 20% off now through September 18th, through next Sunday. So if you decide you want to buy a copy, you can um, save on that uh, purchase now. And here are the two books um, of Joe's that we've been talking about. Uh, and again, the links to purchase them if you wish. And the link to Lee's book. So you can you know, take a look at all this with a little more detail um, if you download that file. And the last thing I want to mention very quickly is our next Zoom event will be November 13th. We will be discussing Storms of the Inland Sea, Poems of Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiving. Um, this is an anthology edited by Margaret Stowawi and Jim Kokus. It is a wonderful, amazing anthology. Uh, Margaret and Jim will be there to talk about how this uh, started, how, where they got the idea and how they went about creating this anthology. And several poets will be on hand to read their work. Um, really a terrific, terrific piece. So that will be our next Zoom event. And I just wanted to be sure to point all of this out to you. Uh, let me go back. All right, so that ends the interlude. Now we're going to go back to Marjorie and Karen, because I want them to talk a little bit more about the collaborative process. Um, I read something about this that, that was published, and they came upon a number of unexpected happenings, unexpected turns while they were working together. So I'd like them to talk about how that influenced their work and also the ways in which they learned from each other or were inspired by each other while they were doing their work together. So go back to Marjorie and Karen. Okay, so I will um, jump in here and Karen, if you do want to add anything, you just interrupt me. But um, so Karen had mentioned um, this image of what turned out to be her patio table. And um, this is one of those instances where 
she sent me this image and I saw the title Memorial for George Floyd in black and white. And I was just really intrigued. And I sh shot her a quick email and I said, what is that in the background? I couldn't quite tell what it was. And, um, but I got impatient. Um, so before she even had time to, to answer me uh, um, by email, I started writing this poem. And to me, the, the first thing I thought was it reminded me of a fence. And so I, I started thinking about the fence uh, around the White House. And I started, started thinking about the riot um, at uh, Lafayette Square and the photo op um, at St. John's Episcopal. Um, and then I started thinking, uh, well, maybe this is a bridge instead. And so then it took this kind of surprising turn. And so then later, you know, I already had the dolls is all kind of drafted before I found out that this was actually uh, Karen's patio table. But I liked what she, you know, said about, you know, putting the, the blossoms there and how it works so well as a memorial. Um, but to me, part of the purpose of the poem or part of the theme of the poem was this ambivalence and trying to interpret things. You know, is it that, you know, and, and part of that is what um, ekphrastic poetry is, trying to think about, you know, how am I going to um, imagine this as um, in connection to how I'm seeing the world or how I'm interpreting the news or, um, or what kind of memorial it is. So here's the poem, uh, Memorial for George Floyd in Black and White. I like uh, Christine's design much better in the book, but this is my rough and ready PowerPoint images. So cracked, gray, gone dead, the stone cold heart pinned by the pale blooms of buds in this city that fences out cherry blossoms and peace. Rubber bullets, pepper balls, smoke bombs, all the unconstrained and uncalled for on parade to a photo op across Lafayette Square, its border street, now renamed in bright caution yellow, to St. John's Episcopal, where the everyday horror of now is colorfully on display in black and white, the charade of posing for the political gone viral, the reality, not virtual, of knees, necks, nooses, chains, chain links, fencing out, fencing in, not again, but still, or is it a bridge, narrow, graded, not beside still waters, but over the teeming, the troubled, waves of multitudes crossing the deadly current, not to the old promised land of denial, but to this other side, rocky, but reclaimed, vast, expansive, unending, ready to till, to sow, to harvest, even now the faint scent of grave strewn blossoms beginning to resurrect the morning breeze. So uh, Karen's photograph um, and her title really gave me a way into this image. And I, I, I may have written a poem about George Floyd, but it wouldn't have been this poem, you know, without this photograph. Um, and the idea of kind of trying to figure out what angle I wanted to use to approach it really was uh, part of um, what the poem is about. Um, and then I wanted to go back to another image that that Karen mentioned. Um, and this was a this is one where the poem came first. And it was actually quite an old poem that I kind of dug up because I was looking for other images that other poems that had some images connected to hearts that could maybe work. And um, and Karen really um, ran with this very kind of haunting. Um, she mentioned the she the word gothic kind of image um, of a, kind of a possessive relationship, and uh, I think it took things out of the poem that I that I knew were there, but even but enhanced them even more. So you know we have a poem, we have the photograph, but together we have something you know, a third, uh, a third piece of, of work, you know, because it's really something else when you put them together, um, which I love and, and is surprising. And, you know, the whole process of discovery um, is what I love about this whole, this um, 
of ekphrasis. Chiromancy. Yes, I trace my own dark poem for you, stretch this lifeline half a century, cut it short. A bandana tight on my head like a tourniquet, like a bandage bloodied from the revolution, like a blindfold on a witch burning stake up the back, skirt flame bright as a banshee or quicker, neck split on a stone, gold hoop glittering, you on the other side of the knife, face shaped by a black cloak, mouth tauter than rope, tightening, maybe one finger at a time, I'd slice save only my palm, small, smooth. This curve here, the curve of your cheek. These lines, the red in your eyes. And again, I think you can see how much more ghostly and um, upsetting the poem becomes with this image added. And then I'll end with a, another um, one that Karen mentioned. Um, and this is another one where the image came first. And um, I was really attracted just to the sepia tones. And um, this is called Heart Tree. And then it reminded me, um, which I don't think was in Karen's mind, um, but it reminded me of the, the tale of Snow White and the hunter who was ordered um, to, uh, by the evil queen to take her into the woods to kill her and to um, to bring back her heart, but of course the hunter has mercy on her, and um, and kills a wild boar and brings back the the heart of the boar. But the tree where this uh, happens, where this mercy happens, um, grows in the shape of a heart. So suddenly, <laughs> this image that that Karen didn't necessarily connect to the the fairy tale brings up, you know, it's connected to memories in my own life, connected to these stories. And then in the poem, there's also that other leap of connecting to the reader and connecting to other artists. And so you can see even that kind of going back and forth of trying to define the term sepia. Sepia is the bare tree forest light of snow white on a night when the hue of every evil stalks her ever afters with envy as twisted as any thicket in this wilderness that scratches and steals the tales she once believed in. Is the queen's bramble thick commands the underling carries in each ear that won't hear and obey as his deadly ax swings its way instead to the neck of the ravenous boar circling her fear blanched body. Is the seed of mercy when she finally sees the forest and the trees, the woodcutter and the woods, the huntsman who refuses to hunt her, no matter what the mirror mirror murmurs to the not fairest of them all. Is the seed of tree that sprouts deliverance when the silent trapper hauls the heavy, the heart heavy in his hands, the heart not hers, back to the heartless kingdom, while she, lying beneath the mulberry's lacerated limbs, looks up to see his tail is now ingrained with hers. The wind calls and she tries to breathe, not dwarfs and apples, not coffins encasing some predestined tale of a prince wary of boars, but something new, unspoken. Remembering the way the huntsman swung his axe, she rises, peers up past branches to color and sky. She climbs and you, reader, climb with her. So that those are kind of my um, ways of just being surprised and inspired by by these photographs of Karen's. Thank you, Marjorie and Karen. Um, really wonderful examples of how wide and deep ekphrastic poetry can be. Um, all the things connecting, you know, the artwork, the poetry, the dreams, the hopes, the fears, um, the memories, uh, kind of all can come together. Very good. All right. Um, now we're going to hear from Joe again, um, and he is going to talk a bit about some of the collaborations he's done with other artists um, and, and briefly just comment on how he sees the value in ekphrastic poetry. So we'll turn it over to Joe for just a couple of minutes. Well, the benefit of writing in response to works of art is that experiences one has with works of art are of intrinsic value. 
artistic performance can be profoundly insightful. Uh, and uh, what a wonderful thing it is to capture an artistic experience for oneself and possibly for readers of one's poems. Uh, one quarrel I had in ancient days was with the uh, writings of I.A. Richards, who talked about poetry as only being able to make pseudo statements. And uh, I've always uh, argued against that because, of course, I think that any statement in a poem is primary uh, because it's, uh, you know, it's an experience of, of the world. And uh, I sometimes had comments from people, well, you know, if you're writing about a work of art, it's, it's you know, kind of doubly secondary because, you know, why don't we just look at the art? But of course, one's experience of an artwork is a unique thing. It's as unique as an experience we have in a relationship with another person, observing an abandoned Buick or, or whatever you might see in the world. Uh, so the, the experience of artworks are primary. So that's one thing that uh, interests me. I've collaborated with quite a few people. As I mentioned, Adam LeBlanc and I have done a number of collaborations over the years uh, in my current book, there's a uh, collaboration, well, actually a ekphrastic poem about a couple, a couple po two poems actually about uh, paintings by Chloe Kang. I've already uh, mentioned um, uh, writing in response to Laura Ruby. One thing I wanted to mention is that, uh, and Laura Ruby knows about this, is that for many years, we've had an exhibition at Ho'omalahia Park on the uh, windward side of Oahu. And it started because there was a sense that a new highway going in was going to destroy the natural landscape and historic sites and so forth. And so the exhibit was called Aloha Ho'omalahia uh, because it was thought we were saying goodbye to this wonderful uh, botanical preserve. Of course, now a lot of us, at least me, uh, I ride to that uh, park on that highway. That we were, in a sense, we're protesting with those early exhibits. But in any case, um, Every year, that exhibition, I, I, uh, Laura was involved in the early years, but I've continued to do that. I often uh, write works in response to the uh, works of people exhibiting there. And uh, in fact, in my current book, Prevailing Winds, there's a couple of poems inspired by the works of uh, Chloe Kang, uh, Garden Eclipse at Ho'omalahia, talking about uh, one of her works there. And also, uh, in, on some occasions in that exhibition, I put my works, uh, juxtapose them to others. If somebody, uh, Russell Tsunabe did a work about a mongoose, and I, you know, kind of put my uh, poem about a mongoose. And I actually, both his work and my work were not done in conjunction, but uh, in a sense, you know, we, I reproduced his work on my broadside as a kind of a way of connecting uh, Conning Fong is another uh, Hawaii artist that I've often uh, done works in response to. And, uh, you know, it's so, th so there's a lot of that going on. In fact, on the cover of my book, A Field Guide to the Wildlife of Suburban Oahu, it has a painting of uh, actually the UH campus called Midnight Runs. One of the reasons why I like this particular artwork is that uh, my office is up in there. And I sort of, I'm in, in a sense inside of Conning Fong's painting. I've actually never written about that painting, but so that, that whole sense there, there's a photographer and psychologist named Philippe Gross. I've often collaborated with him. Nori Naughton is another person. So the occasion of that annual exhibit in May is an interesting thing where if you have an ongoing exhibit where there is a, a kind of a context for collaboration. I think Marjorie was mentioning, uh, you know, how certain things came together for her and Karen because of an exhibition opportunity. I think that's one exciting thing for, for a lot of people is when there are these exhibitions that can involve both poets and artists, uh, both in some kind of uh, sort of systematic way or just, you know, by accident or whatever, but that the, the possibilities of collaboration and again, I think that the recent popularity of, of ekphrastic or art-inspired writing is evidence of that there is an audience for it. People are interested in it. And of course, for me, I mean, what you know, the experience of art is so rich and so nuanced that uh, it really is uh, a type of writing that one needs not any excuse for. 
I called my workshop on, on ekphrastic poetry writing starting with art, because for me, the point is starting with looking at an artwork or hearing an artwork or, or experiencing an artwork in some way. It's not necessary that your artwork is necessary, your poem is necessarily going to, you know, be about or describe or end with what's in the, um, in the artwork, but that idea of starting with art for me is really exciting that you can, I had, I've had students that have started, you know, looking at a particular painting and then ended up writing something totally different, unrelated to that. I have had that experience myself where I end up not even referring to the uh, artwork in the title just because the poem went so far astray. So again, I would advocate for this starting with art as a kind of way to think about this process of art inspired poetry. Terrific, thank you, Joe. And mm -hmm. now we're going to go back to Lee again. And I read something that she wrote where she said, artworks give the poet inspiration to write his or her own narrative or myth. And I was struck by that and I can't wait to hear more about that. So we're going back to Lee. Thank you. And I'm gonna share screen again. Um, Um, so I would just say, well, first of all, Christine, thank you for asking me what my next work is going to be. It's going to, it's going to be called Spiritscapes, and it's about other ways of knowing, very different than anything else I've ever done, but about witchery, tarot, lucid uh, dreaming, voodoo, uh, shamanistic trances, past lives, and so forth. And actually, there's a lot of scientific research uh, being done on this, which is kind of fascinating because uh, I had thought it was more intuitive and more sort of personal reactions to the world, but that's what the next thing is going to be. Um, myth and narrative. So I'm often encouraged to think about a story when I look at an artwork and it sometimes come out as free verse and sometimes as traditional poetry. But I thought I would uh, read a poem about this work by Joan Danziger called Into the Magic. And I'll show you a few slides you see this um, tabletop sized uh, sculpture. Um, here's another view of it uh, with a little bit of close up of the internal flowers and the fleeing horses and the upturned arms of the trees. And uh, here's yet another uh, wide shot and I'll read it. Um, both of the things that I'm going to end with tonight have to do with um, personal myth and narrative during COVID and during confinement. And so my poem here, uh, personally, I was going through divorce and separation and moving from Washington, D.C. to Rhinebeck, New York, to be near family during a very difficult time. And the poem is called Between States. So this is after Joan Danziger's Into the Magic, which she made in 2007. In this year of metamorphosis, of divorce, of COVID-19, of translating to a place where I know no one, I rediscover into the magic, a forest world, tabletop scale, horses fleeing, phantasmagoric creatures prancing, yeah. carnival, and funeral. The sorceress shapes her clay, molding curved tree branches, open palmed hands with wiry fingers reaching heavenward. Exposed roots pregnant with pith protect a cast of little equestrians riding puppet horses, powerful spirits, 
some dash inward, others escape outward. A demon horse and rider chase a riderless steed, a whitish angel figure galloping prays for deliverance. In this year of metamorphosis, the sculptor invites me to make my own myth. I linger longer, pry deeper, fear and fantasy rub shoulders. I dream of a strange ceremony where I receive a yearbook rather than a diploma. Each graduate has a page of memories, pictures, sayings. Mine is blank. In this year of metamorphosis, I am between happiness of habitat and treacherous terrain. I wish for infrared night vision to distinguish between wolves or sheep below to discern if stiff pink hyacinths offer poison or shade, and whether this zone of ambiguity will lift. I must fly like a bat into baby banyan trees, shelter in woodpecker holes, celebrate my homeless body, hanging from a hopeful brain. And then the last one I thought I would do is inspired by music and a very, very well-known song. Let me just shift this share screen image to this one, uh, Leonard Cohen wrote a song called Hallelujah, and it's been uh, sung by many, many, many other singers. And I was very, very moved by Katie Lang's rendition. I'm gonna play a short bit of it to give you the sense of her passion. And then I'll read the poem, which also was written during the pandemic. I heard there was a secret call. Get it playing and playing as You don't really care for music, do you? So the poem is called A Kind of Gospel, inspired by Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. The way Leonard sang it was highly religious in a sexual way. Katie Lang took it over the top. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lyrics about tying someone in a chair, cutting locks of hair, highly rousing, highly rhythmic, orgasmic. Hallelujah. And now, in our time of plague, more and more faces in sequestered places come online, one by one, pleading, hallelujah. How the golden screen heals during time of terror. Individuals once cold and broken. A youth choir no more lost and groping. Families link through distant chords. 
We sing the song 100 times, exquisite faces in sequestered places, find our voices reaching, stretching. When we could not feel, we learn to touch. Maybe there's a soul above. We want, we hope, we pray for love, a melancholic, fragile, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Guitar keeps walking bass line. Lone saxophone fades slowly. An everlasting song always ends in silence. So I just can't thank you enough. And it's been wonderful to be with Joe and Karen and Marjorie. And all I say about acrostics and poetry in general is use all the senses to see, to feel, to sense art, and have a great time. It's fun. Thank you, Lee. That was a really beautiful way to end. Um, and I thank all of you, Joe and Lee and Marjorie and Karen, uh, a really wonderful time together this evening. And there are still people here, um, quite a few actually. If anyone has questions, um, perhaps you, uh, the, uh, the poets will stay around for a few more minutes if anyone has anything they wanna ask or talk about. You can unmute yourself if you wish. If not, then I guess we will bid adieu. Um, again, take a look at the comments that have been, um, people have been submitting during this entire event. Uh, it's really wonderful to read. Um, so thank you very much. Lee, I guess you're the, the last remaining. Really, thank you very much for doing this. Um, oh my goodness, Christine, it just, it's just been such a pleasure. And I still see Richard Hartice, my dear other publisher. And I see my boyfriend there still waiting on his iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming. It just, you know, means so much to me. And um, I can't wait to finish my next book and send it around to you. Great. Thank you. Really beautifully done. And I'm going to sign off now. Good evening to everybody. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Great, great job. <laughs> <laughs>